uh, and the surrounding <clears throat> country. Thank you for that, Dwayne. Uh, this morning we have uh, a special privilege. Uh, you don't listen to me. We have uh, Scott Pilgrim here, the Executive Director of Baptist Mission Australia. And we have uh, Imogen, his daughter as well. I wonder if you'd join me, Scott. We might let people get to know you just uh, a little. Um, but it is great to have Scott with us. He's been uh, how many years now with uh, Baptist Mission Australia? So it's uh, going on uh, about two years and three months, two I think. Two years yeah. and three months. Yep. It's uh, fantastic. And now, just a little, what's uh, life like for you, family and... Yeah, we uh, have uh, a family in New South Wales, older children in New South Wales and three younger kids here, Imogen, um, Ali and Ada. Uh, we came down to Melbourne about five years ago initially to serve on the team at uh, Crossway and then uh, God opened up this opportunity to move into the role with Baptist Mission Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you could put, I guess, your heart in your role, uh, Executive Director, we probably don't always understand what that means, but I guess what's your heart in your role as Executive Director? What's your heart for Baptist Mission Australia? Yeah, I think it's really, uh, I guess, the, uh, the privilege of encouraging our movement, uh, churches like yours, churches across the nation, of what does it mean for us to partner together in, in mission? Uh, I get the privilege of, uh, of leading our team around the world, but we can only do what we do around the world because of the support of churches uh, like yours. And so I guess very much that heartbeat of what does partnership look like? Yeah. Uh, and increasingly around the world, uh, there's a desire for Baptists to come together uh, in mission around the globe and um, that's, uh, that's exciting and uh, I, get, I, I guess to, I get to encourage that day to day which is, which is wonderful. Yeah. And I know watching some of the, the new materials about where we're going as a Baptist movement have been a, a great encouragement to me uh, and I trust to many of us but I'd love to pray for you. Thank you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the work of Baptist Mission Australia. God, we thank you for the, the beauty of being able to partner together around your mission as a movement. God, and we pray that you will continue to grow these partnerships, that you will continue to uh, equip your people and inspire us to be uh, people who cross the street and engage with our friends, our neighbours and all those around us. God, we pray for Scott this morning uh, as he shares with us. God, we pray that you would just use his words to stir our hearts afresh to give us a greater and deeper passion for Jesus and a willingness to take courageous steps of faith uh, for your mission, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, man. Great to be with you today and thank you for the, uh, the invitation. Uh, to uh, to be with you and also to those of you on online today. Uh, we saw that great little snippet, that great video with Andy. And so on behalf of uh, our team, can I thank you uh, for your ongoing support. Uh, I know that uh, Andy very much values uh, the great support of Camberwell here. And uh, let me thank you for that, uh, that privilege as you partner with him. And uh, I'll share a little bit about some of the work that his team's doing around the world today. As we come to one of my favourite passages in the scripture that we just heard read for us, I want you to kind of try and picture the scene here. And can I begin by taking you back about 25 years ago? And it was the, the day I was bringing my now eldest boy, my first son, uh, home from hospital. And there I was, a new dad. And many of you will have experienced that, uh, mums and dads. But suddenly, you know, there's that new life in your hands that you're responsible for. And there I was, uh, strapping PJ into his baby seat and rechecking and rechecking again and rechecking again as that kind of nervous dad. And then I drive out of the hospital car park and I come to the first intersection in Newcastle, the main road where I was living. And here in the car am I kind of full of joy and exuberance and, and here, is, here is life itself. And suddenly I come to the traffic lights and I stop as a hearse and a funeral cortege passes by. I'll never forget that day. It's indelibly kind of marked into my mind. There I was kind of celebrating life in its, its fullness and richness. And there... At the intersection, a kind of death and despair and hurt and brokenness pass by. Luke wants us to get something of that picture 
in the passage that I want us to look at today is we briefly think about what does it mean to, to cross the street. To cross the street with the, the love, the heart, the compassion of Jesus. If you were to uh, go home today and you were to read all of Luke chapter 7, it's like in my Bible we get this white space in the middle. Now, of course, Luke didn't put that there as the writer, but it's almost like he wants us to, to picture these two stories together. At the beginning of Luke 7, uh, we see that Jesus has just performed a miraculous healing. The, uh, the Roman officer whose uh, valued slave was sick is, uh, is dying and Jesus is called upon to perform this miracle and I, I might let you have a read of that later today if you haven't read that passage before. But suddenly Jesus has, has miraculously healed the slave and there's this sense of, of joy and exuberance and the crowd follow Jesus. They leave Capernaum and they follow him. Uh, onlookers. People excited. Who is this man? Well, what's happening here? The, the disciples, others who want to see more miracles. And this large crowd of people leave Capernaum and head towards the town of Nain. Would have been a bit like on Friday night, all those Carlton fans uh, leaving Marvel Stadium full of joy after beating my beloved Sydney Swans. And uh, that sense of walking out of the stadium kind of full of life and joy. But look what happens. Look what happens here. It's a powerful passage, a powerful moment. As this crowd celebrating life come towards the town of Nain, suddenly they are met by a woman who was lost her husband, and now who has lost her only son. A picture in the culture of the day of, of devastation, of desperation. If you were to kind of write a description about what did it mean to kind of see a woman in absolute need, here is that description. No government benefits, you know, no church support, no kind of pensions. Here is a woman who's lost her husband, now lost her only son, a woman who is destitute. And there, as that crowd walk out of Nain with tears and sadness, they meet the crowd full of hope and joy. And of course, what does Luke want us to see? Luke wants us to see where is Jesus? Jesus is in the midst of all of those situations. Luke wants us to see Jesus... The God of all seasons, the God who was with us on the mountaintop, the God who was with us in the valley, the God who meets us in every intersection in our life, then and now. A God of all seasons, a God of love, a God of comfort, a God of healing, a God of grace. And then we step into this passage a little more this morning. And we ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to, to cross the street with the heart of Jesus? What's it mean like Andy seeking to cross the street in Southeast Asia or we're called to in our local neighbourhoods, uh, no matter what our age or our background, with what we have in our hands and our hearts to be the, the hands and feet of Jesus in this beautiful broken world? What does that look like? We get a simple but a powerful insight in this passage of what it means to cross the street with the heart of Jesus because we look at what Jesus did. Verse 13 of chapter 7. When the Lord saw her. I just love that verse. I love that that verse is in scripture. When the Lord saw the woman. When the Lord saw the woman. Here is God breaking into human history. Here is the God of the universe. Now in the form of Jesus who's come to, to bring God to us. And here is God and he looks into the eyes and the face of a single broken woman. And we see Jesus saw the woman. In John chapter 5, when we've got the paralyzed man by the pool who for 40, almost 40 years hasn't walked, the same words, Jesus saw her. The man. I don't know about you this morning, but that brings incredible, incredible encouragement into my life because I'm reminded that Jesus sees me. He sees me as I am. 
uh, with my my hopes and my dreams and my, my gifts and my skills and my aspirations, but he also sees me in my brokenness and my pain, in my frailty, in my humanity. Jesus sees the woman. Jesus sees us. About 20 years ago, Carol, who with her husband David, hit up our team in Southeast Asia where Andy serves. Carol looked into the eyes of a young woman in Southeast Asia, a young woman of a different faith, a young woman with such a different cultural background to Carol, but Carol on the grounds uh, wanting to bring the hope of Jesus in practical ways in that culture. Uh, Carol, a linguist, Carol who wants to to teach people English, but also as she teaches people English, (coughs) bring the hope of Jesus to them. And there were many women that Carol could have seen. But God's spirit put within Carol to see this one particular woman. Uh, I'll call her Alice. Carol came alongside Alice. Her eyes were open to Alice's needs, her family, her world, what made her tick. Conversations began, a friendship was developed, barriers were broken down, bridges were crossed, a a genuine, authentic relationship was forged. Carol saw something in Alice. Alice was offered the first job in the English Institute to learn and grow and become an English nurturer. Today, hundreds of people are, are employed in that English Institute. Alice was the first And over time, watching Carol's life, eating with the family, doing life together, as Carol crossed the street, Alice became a follower of Jesus. And fast forward to today, Alice is one of the senior leaders of that English institute that's booming in Southeast Asia. She's a leader of a faith community. She's a a disciple maker, seeing second and third generation believers come to faith through the vibrant faith communities that we're able to establish with support of churches like yours. And this is the great part of the story. When people from other countries, expats, who come to that part of the world and who want to kind of train in how to best explain the good news in ways that make sense, are they going to ask, will David and Carol teach them? No, most say, we want Alice to be our teacher. We want Alice to be our teacher because she knows this culture, she knows this world, she knows the language, she knows how to to, to share the hope of Jesus in ways that make sense. But how did it begin? It began when Carol had her eyes open to see Alice. Today, we walk out of our worship service, we cross the street, We cross the street in your neighbourhood. We cross the street in my community. And the challenge and the encouragement of each one of us to have our eyes open for mission. And not our eyes open for the thousands, but our eyes open for the one. My sense is what we need to continue to grab hold of in mission today is that I'm not responsible for the mission of Baptist Mission Australia or you're not responsible for the mission of Campbell Baptist Church. The reality is we celebrate a God who is already ahead of us, a God who is already at work in this community, a God who invites us into mission. Mission doesn't rest on my shoulders. Mission is God's and he graciously invites an ordinary person like me to embrace that invitation. And in my world today, already people of peace. If I open my eyes, the neighbour or the friend or or the person in the basketball club or, or the person who I work with, the myriad of people around me, the myriad of people in your world, who might God have already put into your world today that like Jesus, you might have your eyes open to come alongside them with the hope of Jesus. We look at this passage and we see we cross the street. When we open our eyes, Jesus saw the woman. But more than see the woman, Jesus had compassion on her. Now that doesn't uh, really help us in terms of the translation. If we dig down into the, the, the kind of Greek, the street language, it's Jesus saw the woman. 
Of all the people, Jesus' kind of spirit, Jesus' spirit was led towards that woman, and then his gut turned within him. That's the translation. Compassion sounds nicer in our in our text, but his gut was moved. In his in his very kind of gut, bowel, stomach, there was a sense that that's how deep his love and concern and compassion was for this woman. And I'm struck again this morning that that is how much God loves me. That is how much God loves you. A God who would give his all for us. A God who sees you, but a God who has compassion for you. A God who sees me as I am, but as I still can become a work in progress. A God who sees Alice as she was and as she can be. A God who sees you as you are and as you can be. But a God who sends us out with that same heart. A God who doesn't send us out with Religion, but a God who sends us out in relationship with him that we might mirror that, com- that compassion, that we might mirror that heart that God has for us in the lives of other people. We've got a young family working in the Silk Road, the other side of the world, a long way from where Andy is in Southeast Asia in a country where so few people have heard about Jesus in in their language and culture and in a way that makes sense to them. But where so many in that culture on the Silk Road are searching for hope and meaning. And there we've got a young couple, Ben and Petra, and their boys. And Petra is an occupational therapist. Who, who, who's trained professionally and now with Ben has moved the other side of the world and she moved there with a sense that God would use her OT skills to make a difference in that community in the name of Jesus. On the Silk Road, in the country that they serve, uh, it's a predominant shame culture. And so if you've got a child with a disability, kids with disabilities are kind of pushed to the margins. It's kind of shameful. Kids are ostracised, not treated in the beautiful way that we would treat kids with disabilities in our culture today. And here's this young woman from Townsville who's gone to the other side of the globe with the the hope that God might use her and her skills to make a difference in that culture, but not just to help kids, but to allow people to see the, the, the good news, the love and the hope of Jesus. You know, Petra was recently invited to speak at a national health conference. She was invited as a young Australian to speak at a national health conference in that country with government leaders in the building about, what, about possible new directions for children's health. Petra got up and gave her talk in the local language. People were blown away. This young Australian woman speaking the language, but speaking about a heart for kids and the possibilities that kids would not be pushed to the margins, but kids would be given dignity and respect. She got a standing ovation at the end of her talk. People blown away that she would speak in the language and she'd have that heart and care for kids in that country on the other side of the world. Petra could only be there because of the support of Australian Baptist. Andy could only be where he is because of the support of Australian Baptist. Dave and Carol as well. But on the ground, what are they doing? They're modelling the heart of Jesus. They're crossing the street. They're seeing people where they are, but as they could be with the hope of Jesus. Jesus saw the woman. Jesus' heart was moved in compassion for the woman. And we're called to be people whose hearts break for the things that break the heart of God. That prayer of William Pierce, who founded World Vision, when he saw those children in Korea in war camps and he prayed that prayer, God, break my heart with the things that break yours. What does that mean for me and you today? It doesn't mean we're called the other side of the world like Petra. Some of us might be. But is is it today that God needs to even soften our hearts to cross the street? Is it that we are even too busy to cross the street and see others? A challenge for me. Is it that we've, uh, we've, we've taken our eyes off others and our eyes on self or the circumstance in our own life? And today God is telling us, to, kind of encouraging us to look up again and to look out 
and to say, God, break my heart with the things that break yours. That's going to mean something different for each one of us. But as we cross the street, we take the love and the hope of Jesus with us. Jesus saw the woman. Jesus' heart was moved. He saw, he felt, and then he acted. Jesus walks over and touches the coffin. He touches the coffin. And suddenly the young man comes back to life. Suddenly there is life again. And the beautiful translation, Jesus gives the son back to the woman. What's Luke really saying there? Jesus comes to always give back life. Jesus gives back the life to the woman. Now, I don't know about you, Nathan, but I've done lots of funerals in my time. But I've never done a funeral where I've walked up and touched the coffin. And the person has come back to life. If I had, I reckon I would be in the business of getting lots of funerals. So, so what are we supposed to see here? Yes, there's a miracle, but what are, we, what are we supposed to take from that miracle? Luke wants us to see this, if you like, as a window into the kingdom now and not yet. What does Jesus do? Jesus touches the coffin. The young man comes back to life where there's been despair. Suddenly there is hope. Where there's been desperation, suddenly there is life. There is hope. There is love. There is grace. There is newness. There is restoration. And what, is, what does Luke want us to see here? He wants us to see that that is our calling. That we move out. That we cross the street. And what do we do? We seek to bring the kingdom now. And of course we recognise we live in the kingdom not yet. We read in Revelation, of course, there'll be a time where, the, where there'll be no more suffering or racism or discrimination or domestic violence or abuse or cancer or dying. We read that beautiful picture of what is to come and we remind ourselves what we live in the kingdom now and yet you and I are sent out as agents of kingdom grace. Cornelius Platinga says... When Jesus touches the coffin and the man comes back to life, we have a picture of shalom. Shalom. Not just translated peace, but shalom that means restoration in its fullness, joy, hope, righteousness, life, shalom. And Cornelius Platinga says that shalom is when we look at the world and we say it shouldn't be that way. You know, 100,000 people still in our culture, in our affluent Australian culture, homeless. And we say it shouldn't be that way. Uh, domestic and family violence on the increase in our country. And when we say it, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, racism, uh, be that across the world or across the street. And we say it shouldn't be that way. Children in the Silk Road push the margins because they've got a disability. And we say it, it shouldn't be that way. A lonely shut-in in your street. It shouldn't be that way. Someone struggling with mental health in, in, in this local community and pushed aside with a stigma and we say it shouldn't be that way. That's the hope of the gospel. That's crossing the street. That's the heartbeat of what we do at Baptist Mission Australia and it's what you and I are invited into every day as followers of Jesus. Jesus saw the woman. Who is in our world today as we open our eyes? Who might Jesus be inviting us to see that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus? Jesus saw the woman. Carol saw Alice. Jesus' gut was moved. Jesus feels for us and he calls us out to feel for others. Petra saw a child with disability and said it shouldn't be that way in Jesus' name. And then Jesus acts. The man comes back to life and we're invited to move out in our world. Be that through the work that we do in partnership with you or the work that you do here in local mission. What's it mean for us to take the shalom of God, the hope of Jesus to people around us? Let me finish with the last story. 
And this is a story about a, 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 a young man called Peter. And Peter doesn't serve with Baptist Mission Australia. I had the privilege of meeting Peter last year when I was speaking at a church in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. But Peter was trying to grab hold of how could God use him in mission? What did it mean to kind of cross the street? He told me how uh, he'd got weighed down in his kind of Christian life by, the, by evangelism, by that thought that he had to be able to you know, share his faith as he kind of you know, walked down the street. And, and he said, it just became so hard, evangelism, mission, discipleship. I just kind of stepped back, stepped out. But then he felt God's spirit was kind of challenging him to re-engage again in what did it actually mean for him to be a follower of Jesus in his local community. He came to some training that we did at Baptist Mission Australia, some simple training about breaking down barriers and building bridges, forging relationships. During the first lockdown uh, in, uh, in Melbourne 2020 that we all know so well about, an older man moves into the townhouse next door to Peter. I'm going to call him Mark today. He was an older Vietnamese man. He, he spoke uh, some English, but not, not good English. And initially, uh, Peter and Mark tried to have some conversation over the back fence. It didn't take Peter very long to say, Aha, I think this is a person of peace. I think God has brought Mark into my world. How can I be the hands and feet of Jesus? Conversations began to develop across the fence. Peter began to mow Mark's grass verge at the front because he didn't have a lawn mower. Peter felt challenged to uh, begin to read more about Vietnam, the country that Mark had come from, to read about Buddhism, uh, something that he didn't know very much about. He began to engage in learning more about Mark's world. Philip and Mark increased their conversation. Relationships were broken down. Uh, Mark had a, a sense that the church was kind of behind some racism, racism he experienced in the past. So there were some more barriers to break down. Do you know, Peter started to teach himself how to cook Vietnamese. And the time came for, out of lockdown, that Mark could be invited to Peter's house. Mark came into the kitchen and there was Peter and he was cooking Mark's favourite Vietnamese dish. Mark gave Peter a 9 out of 10 for his dish. And this true story today, Sunday afternoon, on the other side of the city, Mark and Peter will get together with three other men from a local Vietnamese church who speak the local language and they will sit and they will read the scriptures together. And Mark is journeying towards a faith in Jesus because Peter began a conversation over the fence. Because Peter crossed the street and mowed a lawn. Because Peter crossed the street and broke down barriers. Because Peter crossed the street and learned how to cook a hot, spicy, chilli Vietnamese dish. Crossing the street in Jesus' name. Jesus saw the woman. Jesus' heart was moved with compassion. And Jesus steps out and acts. He brings shalom. That's what Peter's doing. That's what Andy's doing. That's what we're invited into afresh today as the people of God. Johan Honecki, can't say that name very well, a Dutch theologian, Johan Honecki says, we are called to be shalomatizers of the world. Do you love that? Use that in a sentence this week. We're called to be shalomatizers of the world. We're called to step out to bring shalom, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And it begins as we leave our comfort zones and as we cross the street in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your gracious invitation. We thank you that you would choose to use us, to call us, the mission of God in the hands of ordinary people. 
Thank you that every one of us in this building today has been gifted by you. We have our own life story, our own life experiences. We have different things in our hands and our hearts today. And you invite us individually to move out, to cross the street, to be your hands and feet in this broken world. We thank you for the privilege of partnership. Thank you for this church's support of our work around the world for many years. Thank you for this church's support of Andy. And we continue to pray for him as, as he crosses the street in practical ways, in a, in a very different culture to ours. Give him courage and creativity, perseverance, we pray. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to partner together. We thank you that together we are better and that we are called to move out in mission together. Challenge me, challenge each one of us afresh this morning. Who might you have already placed in our worlds? May it be today we open our eyes afresh, that we can see like Jesus sees, feel like Jesus feels, and act like Jesus acts as we be your people in this broken world. Use us, we pray. Use us today, use us this week in Jesus' name.